Hi. Good morning. Good. How are you? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a little bit of a, a limited time window, um, and uh, so I don't want to. I want to kind of get started, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. I know some people are coming in. Internet hopefully wor is working down here, I, but I do have a, if in case something stops along the way once we all log on, I might have to make a shift, but it should be ready to go. My name is Ryan Crone. I'm the director of the Institute for Personalized Learning, which probably means nothing to you right now, and hoping at the end of this session you'll have a glimpse of what that means. Um, I've been on the job for 100 days uh, as we started it, which has been fantastic, but I've been doing the work for since 2000, uh, September 1st, 2010, here in the state of Wisconsin. I'll talk a little bit about what that was. At that time, I was an administrator and had a clean slate opportunity to open up a school. Uh, and at the same time in 2010, Wisconsin was engaging in a conversation about what we were going to be doing to transform education, teach, and learning. Since that time, I was a district administrator for the last five years, looking at not only one school model, but looking at district and scale models, and really excited about this work. I consider myself a super user of what the Institute for Personalized Learning has been doing over the last six years, because I just basically went and learned everything I could and tried it in a practical setting. Uh, and since that time, over the last 100 days, uh, got a chance to be a part of the Institute. The Institute for Personalized Learning uh, was, was founded by James, James Rickabau. Uh, his recent book, Tapping the Power of Personalized Learning, came out this spring. He's our, still our senior advisor and has been doing a lot of work with us. And I'll talk a little bit about this story and how that book evolved. Because the book is really a story of what's happened in, in classrooms across Wisconsin since 2010. In 2010, there was a regional conversation by our superintendents that just said, this is, we, we have a problem. Uh, there's more money not coming down the tracks. Uh, our, our model is broken, and we wanted to make a regional call to action. It made a transformation, a call to action, uh, and a networked approach. And in 2010, we started the Institute for Personalized Learning, which really our the center of our work is about supporting personalized learning, supporting education transformation, and working with districts, schools, classrooms, and teachers to go from there. Um, believe it or not, I got connected with Arkansas. Wisconsin, so CCSSO, which stands for the Chief Council of State School Officers, which is really, for Wisconsin, his name's Tony Evers. There's 50 states, so there's 50 chief councils on those officers. They had started a number of years ago the ILN, which stands for the Innovation Lab Network, and Wisconsin's been a part of that small lab network of doing innovative work. Arkansas recently has joined that, and in a conference call a few months ago when I started the role, we started talking about not only this conference and this summit, but some of the work that we were doing. That's kind of how my feet have landed here in, in Arkansas today, and excited to be here. Um, I'm from the Milwaukee area. And our team regionally in Milwaukee is a number of school districts that serves basically the entire uh, two-thirds of the students in Wisconsin are just in one region uh, as we go from there. So um, beyond getting better, strategies for thinking and leading beyond incremental incidental improvement. Uh, we'll get in there. If at the end of this 40 minutes, I hope you have an idea of what this means and this symbolizes something to you. In addition, at the end of this 40 minutes, I hope that this sentence or this limerick, or this rhyme, or whatever you want to call it, makes sense to you. So I'll let you read it for a second. Those in the back might be a little tougher. This gets at one of the challenges that we looked at regionally in Wisconsin and across the nation for trying to get going. So there's a couple of stories I'm going to lead with. I won't go too long in these. I know you heard a couple of the stories this morning. Uh, are we familiar with this? Okay, so we need to start talking here sh just with some shout outs, some things that you used to do as a customer of Blockbuster or a user of Blockbuster. I'm sorry, what? Late fees. Late fees. Perfect. You already got late fees. You used to do late fees. And you accepted that as part of the deal. What other things you used to do as a part of the deal with Blockbuster? Travel to a location or, a, or an infrastructure that they had. What else? You were kind. You had like character development built right into rewinding. <laughs> if you're in a membership. Other things that you did as a part of your relationship. You may have gone there to find that they were all checked out and you had to go to another section. Um, so different, thing, different things like that as a customer. Uh, Blockbuster was there. So Blockbuster at one point in time, um, we use this quote, every function had an optimal design. And their function was what? To rent movies. Because at, at a time when people started buying VCRs and that invention became great, it they said, wow, what a great design. People don't want to buy every movie. We could rent them. We could do 99 cent Tuesdays. We could you know, teach them about being kind and rewinding. We could, and then it, you know, this model was based off of something. And their improvement model took off. The fact that I'm in Wisconsin and have a familiar experience as you and, our, and, and many of you in Arkansas or other states with Blockbuster, 
tells me that for the most part, their model took off. And this is the improvement cycle that we're talking about moving beyond just improvement. Because at one point in time, something happened that their life cycle started to change. Anyone want to guess what that might have been? DVDs. The introduction of DVDs or new technology. For, for, for many of the, the businesses, what did they do? Many of the stores did what when DVDs came out? Cut their store in half, and you would go to, yeah, I have a VCR, or I have a DVD player, and I can go to that section. So they, they added technology to the, or they added a new component. For those that invented DVD, there was really truly transformational. From going from film tape to digital was a whole new platform. Uh, but for other people, it wasn't. Um, the business just adopted it as usual as a part of their model. Well, one person uh, decided um, they had a relationship with Blockbuster, and they had a $40 late fee for Apollo 13. Great movie, by the way, but a $40. Anybody know who that person was? Reed Hastings, who was the inventor of Netflix. Okay, so now we're right here, and here's Reed, I'm guessing at this moment in time, and a $40 late fee, and he founded Netflix on the principle of no late fees, and what else did Netflix say that they'd do? mail to your house, but there's a little gamble, right? Would you want to wait a couple of days? There's a, you know, how is that going to work? But the DVD itself was able to go in the mail versus a clunky VHS tape. The DVD format as well was digital, which meant that it could be streamed, which meant there might be a future in streaming, which meant that there were some other pieces. So as we talk about that transformational thing, I want you to think about a customer experience now with Netflix. What is that experience like? You're not driving to an infrastructure anymore. You're driven by wanting to find it at available time. Uh, if you're streaming it, it offers one opportunity, if, or it's, but it's a little bit different. The um, reason I bring that up is there's a story of transformational change here, and the stories of organizations that are recognizing with one infrastructure, you can stay within that, and you can work on this improvement cycle as long as you want. And maybe even when it's coming to an end, what are some desperate things Blockbuster did? Sorry, Blockbuster, I know I'm on video. What are some desperate things at the end that we tried to do? They tried to get into some of these in, in, into this market share of sending things home, and they tried to do two, uh, like two dollar Tuesdays or ninety nine cent Tuesdays, and and some other pieces for the experience. But eventually, the infrastructure just couldn't last, and the design got taken over by uh, some other ideas. Now, Netflix, you can also challenge where are they on their cycle right now? This gap represents sort of a challenge in getting started, and maybe a customer acquisition and a new model and helping people form a new relationship. But the customer experience was different. And the leadership opportunity was different. So I want to just set the tone a little bit because I want you to think about you as a customer experiencing one model versus another and your role that you play as sort of accepting a set of rules, including late fees, which was the first thing that we came out, or a sort of a, a deal, versus accepting your role here. And maybe Netflix is being a little bit more, having a little more greater control and ownership of the experience as, as well. Um, I could say the same about film. At one point in time, Kodak was the leader in, in film. Um, and maybe there's a question when the digital format came through uh, that Kodak lost uh, billions in this conversation because they thought their industry was film. What was their real industry? Images. Images. And think of what we used to do when you get film. You'd buy film, you'd load the film, you'd take pictures, you'd have your thumb over the screen a couple of different times, you'd go get it produced, maybe one hour at a photo mat, you'd come and pick them up, you'd go through them, you maybe got one winner, um, and things like that. And versus what do we do now with the digital format? We get those images, we send them, we take them. I got pictures of my wife sent me pictures of my kids this morning off to school. That would have taken like five days, just 10 years ago. But take a picture, put it in the mail, send it to me, would have gotten it a little late, all of those things. But the, in, the key here, this example, was what? Kodak was never in the industry of film. They were always in the industry of images. And they got caught up on an infrastructure that was based on film. This one's an interesting one losing $5 billion a year over the last couple of years. In the beginning, what was their main job? What industry were they really in? Communication, right? Helping to communicate or deliver some packages or deliver some work. And as communication models have changed, this industry is now being looked at as being um, outdated as communication takes on a whole different model. But yet their infrastructure is completely and efficiently very well designed. For 40 cents, I can write something to you and send it to you and get it in a mailbox. And we have an infrastructure designed for that that continues to drive the framework. Not that any of them are irrelevant, because actually Blockbuster still has a place and movie rental still has a place, and some people still prefer that. Not that uh, film um, doesn't have a place uh, in what it's doing, and not that the mail or other pieces don't have a place. But as, as new things emerge, we have to look at what the user was 
the primary point of this was communication. The primary point of the first one was images, and the primary point of um, Blockbuster was not about an infrastructure and renting. It was really about people wanting to enjoy movies and getting the movies that they wanted. That was this double S-curve conversation to kind of kick off here this morning. What's this equation real quick? You can use a smart device if you have it. Anybody want to know the answer to that? Anyone quick? Any, sometimes there's someone that shouts it out right away. I'll give you an answer quick. That is school in Wisconsin. That equation equals school. One teacher, 28 kids, 52 minutes for a class, six classes a day, for a teacher, five days a week, 180 school days, 13 years, which includes kindergarten. Equals school. It's an equation that, for the most part, an infrastructure that we're designed by in many ways, how we hire, how we design schools, how we design curriculum and instruction, how we process kids through this general equation. But most of the time, that equation is, is representative of our instructional paradigm, where somebody knows something, or a lot of things, and the audience just needs to take that in. Well, in Wisconsin, the Institute for Personalized, started, Institute for Personalized Learning started because of this challenge, which was the learning is owned by the teacher, and it's pushed towards the learner. What's this, what's this equation? What would you put in those question marks? Because the first equation equaled school, but didn't always necessarily equal learning. We asked this question. Out of all of those variables that we could change, what could we change? And the conversation just started to take off. They said, did we always need one teacher in the room? Because the answer was no. There was so much knowledge out there right now, there's oftentimes we didn't need, it, we didn't need a teacher for all learning. Learning could happen outside of school's walls. It could happen in school. It could happen independently. It could happen peer to peer. Do we need four, five, six teachers in a room sometimes? Definitely, because integrated experiences and opportunities for teaming and opportunities for a, a totally different experience was necessary. So the one didn't, out, we didn't need to design every school with 30 rooms that looked the same, that fit one teacher to 30 kids and position teachers at the front. But we were doing that day in and day out. And our superintendent said it's time to make a change. The institute started to dive into this work. Did 28 kids, was that a magic number? Why do we keep buying the same amount of desks for classrooms for that? Because we knew that one to one was important. One teacher with one student and the conferring opportunities and the meeting and the, conf and the, and the set goal setting was important. We also knew that 10 to 1 was fine, that 20 to 1, 100 to 1 would work, even 200 or 300 to 1. And as you saw up this morning, a blended opportunity allows for thousands of people to learn something at some point in time. But you have to talk about what was the optimal experience we wanted. Same with minutes. Why did every class start and stop where time was the constant and learning was the variable? We were having a very hard time thinking about some of these equations that we were following. And yet on top of it, we were trying to design things to fix the problem, but yet letting our general equations stay the same. The learning paradigm looked a little bit different than that first picture I showed you. And I know it's a little sketchy here. It's a high school model. We see a little bit more collaborative team and facilitating, or in an elementary model, a little more active exploration. There's things that are, these the images are becoming more and more familiar across classrooms across the nation. Um, than our traditional model. But yet, most of the time, we're still packing this in within 52 minutes. That was the model and the challenge I faced as an administrator, uh, as a district administrator, and that's the model and the work that we're doing as the institute. That even now, as we're finding new models and new ways to engage learners and new ways to provide student agency and new ways to um, provide conferring and goal setting and other pieces, sometimes it still fits within a box and we still play by the rules as we go. I want to think a little bit more about this of having conversations of our learner with. Uh, with our facilitators and teachers and thinking about how do we work together to meet the standards in the curriculum, we're always not driven one way. This is the conversation we're having in Wisconsin about shifting from an instructional paradigm to our learning paradigm and starting to try to make that shift and find some of these stories that were so relevant. Think about, and we look at this all from the learner, from the learner's point of view, each and every way, just no different than you'd look at it as the customer's point of view. The customers actually put Kodak out of business because they wanted the images, they didn't want the film. And our customers is what we're in this business for, our learners, which is where our user-centered approach starts. A couple quick last analogy, basic intersection, stop and go. We can approach this from an improvement standpoint. We can ask questions about is it safe, is it well maintained? City engineers might ask, are the signs and the lines installed and maintained accurately? Somebody rode in, drove into a stop sign last night, let's make sure we put that back up so that it's safe. For the driver or for the user, it's kind of a based on an established set of rules, and they've agreed, OK, we'll follow these, these rules. A transactional change, which is a little bit different than just improvement, 
might be talking about, well, there's new compliance, and we heard about ESSA this morning, we heard about No Child Left Behind, or we heard about new compliance pieces and districts that are coming in. For an engineer, has everything been ordered and installed as dictated? That's a strong word, I probably, you know, maybe as, 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 as introduced. As well as, for the driver, it's still, their experience is still the same. Still going to up to that interchange, even if a couple of rules have changed, the speed limit has changed, maybe it's a yield sign now rather than a stop sign, maybe it's uh, something else. Sometimes we approach things even from a transformational lens, but we forget about the user. In this question, maybe bringing forward from the stop sign to a traffic light, or maybe going from your classroom and adding technology or one-to-one -one devices, has changed some things about new beliefs or strategies or processes, but we've kept the students in the same position. Now they just have a digital portfolio rather than a paper one. Or they're posting things online rather than on the refrigerator for their parents to see, or some other pieces, and we have to think about what that would be. So our ultimate conversation and thought of is this one. What, anyone know what that is? Roundabouts? Are they, are they here? They're here. Okay, some facts about roundabouts. They're incredibly much safer than an, uh, an intersection with T-bone accidents. Uh, if you look at the Department of Public Instruct or Depar Department of Transportation, you'll find facts about why this design happens, why head-to-head -head collisions change. But actually, think about it from the user standpoint. People complain about them first. People worry about them. People talk about them. But what does it really make you do? It really engages you in a process of thinking and decision making and owning the experience. It actually increases traffic flow through. They're actually more effective than a traditional system. It actually requires you to think and interact with the experience. So instead of putting more and more stop signs in, repainting the reflective lights on the ground and making sure that things are safe and maintaining order and control, um, this is the type of thinking that we're promoting for looking at the learning experience and looking at our learner and how can they navigate through our system, not on a, base, a control based system, but on a system that's based off of greater control of our user. Uh, which ultimately is what's happening in a lot of industry. I mentioned three to start, which is Blockbuster and Netflix. It was really less about that. It was more about what were the users' um, trends and going towards and what kind of controls did they want. Or with communication, people just aren't going to wait three or four days to write something in the mail and send it when a text or a tweet or an email has helped. That communication opportunity is here now, but yet there's still some control aspects of other pieces and pieces there. So I throw that piece out here uh, in thinking about that. And this would be a quick question for table talks. I know you don't know the people next to you, but just for two minutes, you think of an example of something that you're doing maybe right now in your work that you keep maintaining the status quo. You're just kind of keeping it as it is. It's under your skin a little bit. Or something that you maybe think, you know what, we're starting to make some change, but it's maybe just more of a compliance of a new thing. Maybe you've started to change something, but it's really more about adults and an infrastructure than really changing the experience for the learner. And last but not least, what our hope, my hope is here at the end, because I'll get to this in the second half here this morning, is talking about ways that you've engaged in design work that will require new ways of thought and action by all participants, especially for the role of the learner. So just take two, three minutes. I'm going to ask for a couple of shout outs of examples of maybe work that you're doing along the way, things that are familiar here and maybe you're struggling with, as well as something here. So I just threw a lot at you in 10 minutes, but if you could turn and talk and find an example of somewhere in your work that you're doing. You might have to introduce yourself to someone next to you. About one more minute.
All right. Anybody willing to share an example? Any example? Last thing I want to do is stop the talking, I know, that, but the, the clock is ticking. So anybody have an example of somewhere along the way? Let's start with the best part of it first. Anybody thinking about how they've engaged their learners in new roles, maybe shifting them from a, a, a passive participant to an active participant or a passive recipient? Anything? OK. I'll, um, I'm going to point out here, I'll get into this for a second. There's many examples out there. I mean, again, take a look at the work that you're doing on a daily basis and ask yourself, from a leadership standpoint, how is this work going to move the work? How is this work going to drive the work forward that we really want to do? Here's some basic examples. Common reform strategies have led along the lines of changes in governance or investments in technology. I mentioned the one-to-one -one piece. Maybe grading reporting systems changing from this to that, but not truly engaging the learner as a part of that, or maybe not truly shifting it to proficiency-based experiences or other pieces like that. Student grouping strategies, oh, we're going to go to this now, we're going to go to that, we're going to have this, we're going to have that, but still continuing to have the same exchange of information. Schedules, calendars, how many days, how many minutes, how many this, how many that, but yet things are still maintained as a constant. Um, Assessments and tests, and if we test more, if we test more, if we test more, what, might, what that might be. Collaboration time, class size, school size. Uh, I was in a conversation with somebody before about some of these pieces. Common strategies look at this. Thinking about improving the system that already exists. Um, oftentimes it feels like this. That is an air conditioner. That's my office. Um, and at some point in time, we just got to let it go. Uh, that's the image that we use to start our work in Wisconsin. It's like asking a typewriter to do what your smartphone can do now. It's like asking a typewriter to do what your computer now. We're, our, our society has changed. The needs of our learner has changed. And yet our, our design is still the design. And we're trying to keep it going as long as we can. Because why? I don't know. Because the same reason our, my mailbox is outside of my house. It's there. It exists. It's important. It's in, it has a huge infrastructure. It's critical. We have habits that we want to use it. But at the same time, we've got to start to ask the question of, is it designed for learning? Or is it designed to provide instruction? But it, or is it designed for learning? And that's the question that we're leading with today. Um, choosing to increasingly invest time, effort, money, and other resources in a system without the capacity to deliver the sought after results is not a wise strategy. This is about the getting the, right, the wrong thing right. We need to get the design right and focus on improving, iterating, and aligning for results. So I'd, I'd hate to say a um, couple quick things here. Um, in, with our institute team, we started with these assumptions. Tell me if these are familiar. I'm going to go through them pretty quick. Some assumptions in education. And while we all know that's not true, we usually hand out schedules and class lists and bell schedules the first thing when people get back to school each year, right? I'm going to go back to this one a second. And what are we doing when, when this happens? We batch them in one way, and then all of a sudden we start mixing them around what they're learning, and then we start mixing again. And we, but yet, the dominant system that's pertaining is your age and your grade, but then we're going to do amazing things in between there. This is a f an interesting one. I'll give you a one minute story. A few years ago when we started um, uh, our school, it was, it was actually a STEM-focused school. I was getting tired of people asking me what, what questions about STEM, what curriculum we use, and what, what, what. So we said that STEM stood for strategies that engage minds. It was in 2010, the same year that this opened. That's what we focused on. And we talked about what those strategies we were going to use that would engage the student's mind. The compliance piece, there was a teacher there, one of my favorite teachers still to this day. She wanted to assign the kids at, at lunch, to lunch tables. And I was like, oh my gosh, Amy. And, and she's a good friend of mine. I said, that's like the farthest thing of what we want to do, especially at lunch, like if we don't trust. And I asked why. And she said, well, because, and she had a number of rules. Then I looked at lunch the first couple of days of when we opened the school, and the line was like down the hall. 
And I thought to myself, as an adult, there's no way I'm standing in that line if I have a 30-minute lunch, so spend 15 minutes standing in line like this. And if I would, I most likely would start poking at the person in front of me or hitting them the way that the kids were behaving. Um, so we asked ourselves, really, what are we trying to be? And what do we really believe? What were our assumptions about kids? Our assumptions that they couldn't make choices, they couldn't make decisions, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. I said, well, then that must be what we have to design our school around. That has to be a strategy that we design. So for that lunch period, which was a half hour in Wisconsin, we had two lunch periods, so it was an hour. Um, teachers have a right to a 30-minute duty-free lunch, which we understand. We just opened up that whole hour opus ca open campus for our middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade kids. And the concept was, you can do whatever you want. And our strategy was that because we were so afraid that they didn't know what to do, that we would teach about that long way. We call it Connect which is a goal that we wanted the kids to connect with what they needed to do the most, which required them to be able to do a self-assessment, to advocate for themselves. These are middle schoolers. They couldn't get to school before and after school. School wasn't even open. When was the last time they were going to have a chance to learn to advocate for themselves and use time wisely and other things? The nice part about Connect is it started with a lot of compliance. I have a lot of war wounds having conversations with good friends of mine and teachers that were there about what kids can and can't do, and we just talked about what we really wanted them to be able to do. What I can say now about compliance, and this gets at an assumption story, is that once we got it going, Connect is not only alive and kicking in that school six years later, but they do full days of Connect. They do full weeks of Connect. They allow kids now have become such owners of their learning. They know how to commit to learning. They know how to advocate for themselves. That they'll walk into school on a Thursday and Friday and know that it's two days of Connect, and they walk around and go finish up science labs. They go meet proficiencies in class to class. They go meet with their teachers. They ask for feedback on a, learning, a writing piece that they weren't happy with, they wanted to do more. Totally different structure. It was a small inroad. It was one conversation because I was tired of watching a, a line that people were complaining about kids being bad in the line. I said, I'd never stand in that line if I had 30 minutes to eat each day and I had to waste 15 minutes in it. But it led, we started with this premise, with an assumption that kids couldn't control themselves and didn't know how to behave. And, couldn't, and then part of it was true. Our sixth graders still struggle with connect when they start. But we've been teaching it purposely and intentionally because of what it has fueled in terms of their disposition, their agency, and their ability to become co-designers of the learning experience. How about metaphors? Throw some at you quick. probably each think of a story where these metaphors uh, you know played out one way or the other last one I'll point out again what if we thought of teachers less as imparters of information more of talent developers what if we thought that every child that walked into our school today was a developing writer and that the rest of their life they're going to continue to develop as a writer and our job for the, that experience with them is to provide them with the best experiences they can to continue to write and the best opportunities we can to continue to give them feedback and support them in that writing journey and they'd see themselves and identify as themselves as a writer and as a learner and in constantly in development. And they would less take classes from us and get assignments from us, but they'd more be writing for themselves and being able to have that relationship. That requires an, a metaphor, that requires an assumption about who our learners are and that they're all writers. And it requires us to be really purposeful that we're not teaching classes and we're not covering standards, we're developing writers. And that's what we wanted to have as a piece. As well as if we develop not only as a writer, but their mindset that they're a writer and a, a learner and that they have an opportunity to self-assess where they're at going at next, that we wanted to fuel a system based off of that. Last one, mental models. This is one that we had to get over a lot. We have a great infrastructure that we keep pushing it on teaching. And teaching is very important. But we have a design challenge that we want to talk about how then was, when that works. Whoops. A couple of these talk about teaching. In this room is Krista Crowder and Lisa Welch. You can wave real quick. They're running sessions after this one. Um, they're both from Wisconsin. This is, not a, this is not a judgment on teaching. Those are the two hardest working people I've probably ever met and two of some of the best designers of shifting an instructional paradigm to a learning paradigm as you get to hear that. This is, this is about a design challenge that they had to overcome within the system to be able to meet the needs of their learner. I'm not going to talk too much about each of them, but I, when I first met Krista, she was a teacher following the equation that I showed beginning in a school and she just knew that there was more to do with the kids and, a, and that she was missing out on an opportunity. That was the question that was driving her. 
And she met somebody else in the school, Jeffrey Taggy, who had said, there's something else that we could be doing, let's team up, and they just started. But where they've gone now in Wisconsin is the Flight Academy, is one of our top models as well as, as, well as Explore, uh, which Lisa will be sharing, some of the top models in the state of Wisconsin, but it took five, six years to to, uh, as they developed and continued to iterate, but they worked on some of these ideas. So by all means, this is not about, um, this is about framing our work. Uh, this is not about a, a, a shot at teachers. This is about framing our schools. This is not a, a shot at public education. This is about looking at our design challenge that we have and framing it out. Um, so what would this look like in action? Uh, here's our institute's definition of personalized learning. And it gets a little long. It might be a little bit hard to read. It's an approach to learning and instruction that is designed around the individual learner, readiness, strengths, needs, and interests. Learners are active participants in setting goals, planning learning paths, tracking progress, and determining how learning will be demonstrated such as learning objectives, concepts, method, pacing, and then likely to vary from learner to learner as they pursue proficiency related to established standards. A fully personalized environment moves beyond both differentiation and individualization. We were established in 2010, as I told you. We have a number of member districts here in Wisconsin as well as other uh, states that we work with. We support more than 100 projects. We have a growing national network. We do everything from big convening and conferences to local conversations, um, consulting. But my favorite part of the job that we do is where I put my energy is, which is finding people individually that are having a design challenge or a conflict in their work to reach kids or within a school, and you just start to figure out what's the first step we can take. It's the story of a small step at Connect. It's the story of Krista saying, I think that there's something else we could do. It's the story of each of these examples. There's a principal, his name is Tim Dorway. He's out of Minnesota. Got a chance to meet him through some of this work. He made the paper because he quit using substitute teachers, um, which is an issue in Wisconsin and Minnesota, finding a number of them. And in the, in the, they did an article about it in the paper. Well, I read the 